Welcome to my channel. I'm Jason White. This is Jason's Weird Reads. And on this channel, I like to talk about books. Mostly horror books, fantasy, and science fiction. So if that sounds like your cup of tea, please hit the subscribe button. Alright, so this is Lost Gems number four. I haven't done one of these videos in a long time, but basically what this is is where I talk about books that I feel are underhyped and need to be discussed a little bit more, if not a lot more. <laughs> and with these lists, I started doing this with the first one is I like to add in a popular author in there because popular authors also have books that just don't hit the mark for some reason. Usually I only have five, but this time I have six. Um, all right, so the first one is Man on the Ceiling by Steve Resnick Tem and Melanie Tem. I read this book, uh, actually a lot of these books I have read a long time ago. And so I'm going to be reading the synopsis. I hope you don't mind. Um, but I'm going to tell you how it affected me um, along with the synopsis. Now, I read this book uh, somewhere around 2008, 2009 from, I think it's a shorter version I read because there's a couple of different versions of this. Uh, you can buy this as, as a single right now um, on Amazon. Uh, it's just that story. I think there might be a couple other stories attached. Yeah, I read this one uh, from an anthology called Poe's Children, I believe. And I, I that anthology did not get very good reviews on Amazon or Goodreads, but I don't know why. I thought it was a fascinating and, and incredible anthology. But let me read you the synopsis for what this story is about. Um, there are two interwoven memoirs of love, loss, and family with a haunted, frightening edge. In 2000, American Fantasy Press published an un... I'm gonna have to get my peepers on here, sorry. In 2000, uh, American Fantasy Press published an unassuming chapbook titled The Man on the Ceiling. Inside was a dark, surreal, discomfitting story of the horrors that can befall a family. It was so powerful that it won the Bram Stoker Award International Horror Guild Award, and World Fantasy Award. The only work ever to win all three. Now, Melanie Tem and Steve Rasnick Tem have reimagined the story, expanding on the ideas to create a compelling work that examines how people find a family, and how they hold a family together despite incomprehensible tragedy, and how, in the end, and how, in the end, they find love. It's loosely autobiographical, uh, the man on the ceiling has the feel of a family portrait painted by Salvador Dali, where the story and reality blend to find the one thing that neither can offer alone, truth. Now, this story is definitely about uh, love and loss. Uh, in fact, it dwells on the whole idea of uh, death being like a hunter. It's the death being the man on the ceiling and he's always sitting up there watching and waiting for the right opportunity to strike and that's what I remember mostly about it and of course I think in the story uh, they lose their uh, 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 their son or their daughter one of their kids to death <laughs> and it, it's so it's also a story about how to deal with that and overcoming it it's a very touching story and it's uh uh, it hit home for me because I fear I fear death. I, I I think I came round to the idea of my own mortality way too young in life, and and this this uh, story really affected that. And as I mentioned, it says in there um, that this isn't the story that I read. I should probably reread it just to see uh, the differences if I can even remember uh, all of the old stuff. But uh, the one that you can buy on for your Kindle. And I believe there's a physical copy too. Don't quote me on that though. That's the one they were talking about here where they went and uh, and reworked it. Now unfortunately, you know, this story, I, I mean, this story sort of comes true for everyone. But Melanie Tem is no longer with us. She died, I think, five, six years ago. And so rest in peace, Melanie. And uh, Steve Rasnick Tem, he's still, he's still writing stories as far as I know. I talked to him uh, a while ago for the Darkness Dwells podcast, and he was a, a, a great person to talk to. Uh, second up is definitely um, the thing I keep saying I'm, I know I'm biased towards, but I can't help it. It's a, it's a great story. I absolutely love it, and that's Plank Children by my friend Michael Schutz. 
Now I read um, I read this early on in its uh, inception. It took him forever to edit it. <laughs> and I, I even told him a couple of times, I'm like, you, you can't be as perfectionist as you are. But, but I, you know, that's probably something I shouldn't have said. I mean, it's his pro process. But, he, you know, he, he took that. He's like, yeah, I know. I, I, I stress too much. <laughs> but uh, let me read you the synopsis. This is a def definitely a book, I think, that uh, needs to be talked about a lot more. I've, I've called it Asylum Horror uh, on here on the channel. That's just my weird little definition of it but really it's like school boarding house uh haunted schooling boarding house that uh that it's about but you know to me uh, a school boarding house an asylum they're they're basically the same <laughs> uh, all right so here's the synopsis for that miles Baumgartner must start his life over at 41 he lost his boyfriend his home his job worst of all his beloved nephew Ian died in a car crash nine months ago. So why is there a new photo of Ian on Facebook? Miles follows a trail of rumors and half-truths to a long-abandoned orphanage in Sconson, Northwoods. But St. Hamlin's is not as empty as he expected. Snowbound, Miles is plunged into a world of madness and evil children. Miles' personal demons are unleashed. The terrors tighten their grip as he uncovers the tortures Ian and the children suffered. To have any chance at a new life, he must escape before the horrors stalking the labyrinth of hallways curse him to walk eternally within the evils inhabiting St. Hamlin's. So, this is very much a, a labyrinthine uh, horror story. It, it's very dark. <laughs> and there's some very twisted things in here uh the writing and the prose the characterization it's all it's all great michael schutz is a writer i think one reason why he might be uh not as discussed in the horror community is because he's not he's not as prolific as some other writers uh, uh which is too bad but you know uh i understand it's, i mean look at me <laughs> he's much more prolific than i am so who am i to talk anyway uh, next up, I have Red Equinox by Douglas Wynn. Now, if you like uh, Lovecraftian type, uh, especially Lovecraftian thriller type stories, then this is no doubt for you. I read this uh, a couple years ago and I loved it. Let me read you the synopsis. The Red Equinox has dawned and the old gods who have slept for aeons are stirring. Urban explorer and photographer Becca Phillips was raised in the shadow of Miskatonic University, steeped in the mysteries of her late grandmother's work in occult studies. But what she thought was myth becomes all too real when cultists unleash terror on the city of Boston. Now she's caught between a shadowy government agency called Spectra and the followers of an apocalyptic faith bent on awakening an ancient evil. An urban warfare breaks out between eldritch monsters and an emerging police state. She must uncover the secrets of a family heirloom known as the Fire of Cairo to banish the rising tide of darkness before the balance tips irrevocably at the Red Equinox. This, uh, I remember, this is a series actually, it's the first of a trilogy. And I remember enjoying this first book a lot because it reminded me a little bit of uh, uh, Predator Part 2 with Danny Glover. There's a subway scene in this book that's very reminiscent of the subway scene in that movie. And it's fucking awesome. But that's not the only reason why I think this book is awesome. It's just awesome from beginning to end. And uh, There's scary, terrifying things. And there's also an element of thriller. And it's all within... Uh, it all has Lovecraftian monsters in it, and that is just, that's awesome. I think it's the best of the series. It's just my opinion. But, uh, you know, you could go on and read the series. They're good, too. But uh, Red Equinox is, is really great, and that's by Douglas Wynn. Definitely check it out. Um, next up, number five, is Serpent Shadow by Daniel Brom. Uh, this is another sort of uh, cosmic horror, the Mayan, Aztec uh, sort of 
excuse me, uh, culture into uh, account. Let me read you the uh, synopsis. In Cancun, 1986, Mayans and Mexicans are fighting each other using strange powers they do not understand. A young American, alive with his first taste of star-crossed love, finds himself caught in the crossfire. Who is... Who is the mysterious and deadly white lady murdering tourists? What strange otherworldly things wait in the jungle? Will our young hero beware or heed Saint Death's call? Brahms' debut novel delivers a smart, character-driven adventure in the unique and powerful style readers encountered in his story collection, Night of the Marchers and Other Strange Tales. Um... So this this novel, the Serpent Shadow, takes place uh, in Cancun. It has a Mayan pyramid, and uh, they uh, accidentally, or they no, they don't actually. They run into a cult that uh, is trying to release an ancient god onto the world and basically destroy the world. It's an apocalypse uh, cult. Our main character gets mixed up in that, and and it's up to him pretty much to stop it uh it's it's a lot of fun it's very short i don't know why they call it a novel because it's basically a novella but uh it's a very quick read and it's a lot of fun uh that was number four i said it was five but i was wrong because number five is the last mile by tim wagoner now i read this one uh shortly before starting my booktube channel and it's batshit crazy i mean it's literally batshit crazy I love this book. It's so it's so far out there. Tim Wagoner is known in the horror field for writing weird horror. His horror stories are pure horror, but they're also very weird, usually. And this one is no exception. I'll read you the synopsis. All Dan Juan, and it's pretty long. I mean, it's a pretty short book, but the synopsis is pretty long, so bear with me. All Dan wanted was to be a good husband and father, to provide for his wife and daughter, to keep them fed, warm, and safe. But then the malevolent god beings called the Masters arrived, and their darkness spread across the world, reshaping it into a twisted realm of savagery and madness. In exchange for his family's protection, Dan now serves one of these alien gods, obtaining human sacrifices to feed his Masters' internal hunger. Like so many people since, the world changed, Alice has had to do unspeakable things to survive. Unfortunately for her, she's Dan's choice for his next sacrifice. Now Dan drives along the shattered remnants of an old world highway, headed for his master's lair. Alice bound hand and foot in the back seat of his car. Dan may not like what's what he's become, but he'll do whatever it takes to protect his loved ones. Alice doesn't intend to relinquish her life so easily, though, and she plans to escape, no matter the cost. But in the world after, everything, animals, plants, even the land itself, has become a predator, and the journey to the Master's Lair is almost guaranteed, is an almost guaranteed suicide run. But Dan won't give up, and he won't stop fighting, not until he makes it through the last mile. And, you know, that synopsis makes it sound like it's batshit crazy. But that's because it is batshit crazy. There's things coming from the sky. The sky itself is alive. It, and it's... Read it. <laughs> it's hard to discuss. You, you need to read this book. It's it's awesome. And if you haven't checked out Tim Wagoner, I don't see anybody on, on HorrorTube really talking about Tim Wagoner. You need, you need to check Tim Wagoner out. All right, now for the big release, book number six here. Um, now, I talked to Ramsey Campbell, and I mentioned that this is my favorite book of his. And this book does have a bit of a cult following, I have found. But Ramsey Campbell himself said he doesn't like this book. <laughs> he says it's one of his least favorites of his. And I'll, I'll put a link to that interview that I did on The Darkness Dwells With Him down below, so you can check it out yourself. Um... But, you know, that's, I kind of hate it when authors do that. When you're like, oh, I love, I loved your book. This book was just so awesome. And they're like, oh, well, I kind of hated that book. <laughs> and you're like, oh, really? Really? The creator hates that book? But, you know, them's the breaks. They at least 
published it. They didn't keep it in a closet saying this is awful. Maybe there's a reason why they hated it. But uh, yeah, he, he told me that in the interview. You can go check that out. But this is the, the synopsis. Um, and that's, uh, did I say the title? It's Midnight Sun by Ramsey Campbell. Uh, old age. Don't age, people. If you can find a way, stay young. Okay, so Ben, uh, ben Sterling brings his wife and children to his childhood village, where in a great forest, an old house holds the promise of all their dreams. But among the pines, something seems to be gathering, glittering in the icy air. Uh, that... What I remember of this book is the reason why it spoke to me so much is that I've, I've said many times on this channel that I have it's SAD, SAD. That means uh, Seasonal Affective Disorder. And basically that means that during the winter time, I often find myself uh, having a lot of difficulty finding motivation even to like get out of bed in the morning or tie my shoes. It's uh, it's very much a struggle. But, you know, reading books like this made me think that there was something, there are some themes in regards to SAD. And I don't know if SAD was, because this book was like published in 1985 or something. Uh, I don't think SAD was a term back then, but I think there's something, there's a theme in the story regarding uh, the idea of winter kind of coming in and destroying everything. <laughs> for a little bit and I remember uh really loving this I, I I remember I didn't enjoy the first half of this book very much I felt that the family uh they didn't exactly have a very realistic uh dialogue with each other um maybe that's why Ramsey Campbell doesn't like the book because most of the dialogue I come across uh family dialogue or friend dialogue whatever um he's usually very good at that but he didn't really nail it there. But once the horrors start, that's where I really love this book. And I just gobbled up the rest. And I, I highly recommend it as well. So that is it. That is, uh, that's Lost Gems number four for everyone. Um, you know, this list of uh, what I think is, is not, it's finite. It's not infinite, although it could be. But I'm, I'm just not that well read enough yet. So... That's why these videos slowed down. I went through my list. It was sometime in December, and I was like, "Well, this one, this one, this one. These, all, all these books that are on this list here, they uh, they should be talked about more." And so I was like, "Boom! <laughs> there is another Lost Gems video." So thank you for watching. Keep being creative. Keep being safe, and take care of one another. Be kind. And I'll catch you guys in the next book's video.